the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the call at the midnight cry we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that comes again I look around me I see prophecies fulfilled. The signs of the time, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. That midnight cry. And the midnight cry. The bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children.
Glory to God. Send the children out that door. The children, send them out that door yes, right there. Children's uh, service, you can come out through this door, please. Exit through this door. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. After that, I'm almost embarrassed to get up here. They really did an outstanding job this morning. Amen. Amen. Goodness gracious. That's one of my favorite songs, too. I don't know how they knew that, but you know, I looked up there, even the dog was singing. I, mean, I couldn't believe it. Wow. We'll be finding 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you're finding that, I'll give a few introductory remarks, about 10 minutes worth, and we'll get to the text. But I was thinking this past week about this message, and, you know, this may be, may very well be the most important message I have ever preached. Now, every time I have the opportunity to preach, I think in the back of my mind, this might be the last time I have the opportunity to preach. So for that matter, the message is important, but the subject of this message this morning is probably the most important subject one could ever preach on. And of course, I'm talking about the resurrection of believers. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this message is of first importance. It is of first importance. So as believers, we may teach different doctrines, that is, different bodies of teaching from within the Bible, such as the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of last things, which deals with the end times, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Word of God, how we got the Word of God, the doctrine of the Son, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, doctrine of sin all of that. But there is one doctrine that rises to the top of all of that, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ because, and, the resurre and the future resurrection of you and me as believers. And the reason it rises to the top, because if that one's false, they all fall to the ground. So we'll be thinking about that this morning. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and how that is the foundation for our faith and the fact that we too will one day, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too one day will be raised from the dead. By the way, do you know why we as a church, not only here in Hodgenville, but really around the world, meets on Sundays? because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And so the church historically has met on Sunday morning for that, or Sunday uh, for that matter, not necessarily in the morning, but sometime on Sunday for that matter. So thinking about that, there are more than 300 verses in the New Testament that refer to the resurrection of Jesus. So 300, more than 300, must be important, right? Must be something that uh, God wants us not only to think about, but to really get in our mind and heart so that we can know for sure that Jesus has risen from the dead and for that matter, know for sure that one day, should we die, we too will be raised from the dead. So more than 300 verses in the New Testament. The Bible tells us Jesus was raised from the dead. And because of that, we too will be raised. In Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that the apostles proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, we find the apostle Paul proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Now, earlier in Acts, uh, we see the apostle Paul uh, standing uh, nearby while Stephen was being stoned to death for his faith. And then, of course, Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it totally transforms his life, and he begins to proclaim that Jesus has risen from the dead. In Romans chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible tells us that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will one day raise us from the dead. To me, that's one of the greatest passages in all the Bible to think about, that one day the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise me from the dead. If the Lord tarries and I die, he will raise me from the dead. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that this is our living hope, that we will be raised just as Jesus was raised. More scholars today, and it's something between 66 and 75 percent, believe that something really happened to Jesus after his death. 
than those who do not. The resurrection, of course, is a miracle of God, and your resurrection and my resurrection also will be a miracle of God. But the weight of the evidence says that Jesus was raised. In fact, we have more evidence than most Christians know about, and really more evidence than we need to prove that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's really simple. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning and end of everything. If we can be sure of these three things, Jesus is the Son of God, He died on the cross for our sins, and that He was raised from the dead, then Christianity naturally follows. In other words, something happened in that, at that 2,000 years ago in that garden tomb where Jesus' body had been laid after he died on the cross. Something happened that day, and it forever changed the world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But Christians' claim flows something like this. This is what we believe. We believe that Jesus was God. We believe that Jesus became man without ceasing to be God. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Therefore, whatever Jesus taught was true because he's Lord. And so when Jesus says we should follow him, we should listen. Amen? We should listen and we should follow him. This logic doesn't work on any other religious leader, so-called religious leader, except the Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection was the central proclamation of the early church, and it remains the central proclamation of First Baptist Church, Hodgenville, Kentucky. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now let's look at our text this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And by the way, this chapter uh, is all about the resurrection. In fact, it is the most detailed account uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the future resurrection of believers. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter, uh, but we don't. Uh, but we'll just read a few passages and make a few comments. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, we'll begin in verse 3. Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance. You know what? Y'all stand up. Let's be, let's be resurrected from the pew this morning. Let's, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance. There's the title of the message. What I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now skip down to verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep, that is those who have died in Christ, have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. Father, we thank you this morning for the wonderful, glorious truth of the resurrection. And Father, we just pray this morning that as we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our own resurrection, Lord, we just pray that you would fill our hearts with hope for that which is to come. And Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have as believers to gather together this morning to worship and to praise your holy name, to hear your word proclaimed, and to know, Father, that just by being in your presence today, we will become more like Jesus, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So. The flow of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is this. Jesus died 
Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. Jesus appeared to others. And we too will be raised one day. And three things can be said about the resurrection itself. Uh, as we think about the importance of the resurrection and notice in verse 3 that Paul says that this is of first importance. Again, this rises to the top of the list. No matter what you believe about Christianity, it all starts with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 3, Paul says the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important teaching of Scripture. It is the foundation for everything else we believe as Christians. Everything else we believe about the Bible, everything we believe about salvation, everything we believe about Christianity in general, everything we believe about our own future resurrection and the afterlife, it is all wrapped up in the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the resurrection is priority number one for believers. Belief in the resurrection of Christ is priority number one. In fact, uh, Paul writes elsewhere that that in order to be saved, we have to believe that Jesus died and rose again. That's how uh, important yet basic this doctrine, this teaching in Scripture is. Verse 4 tells us that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that he was raised. That's the basic gospel message. Of course, the word gospel means good news, and so uh, it is the good news that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. It is good news. And most of the world today, they, they don't receive it as good news. In fact, it doesn't even make sense to most people today uh, when you talk about this idea that Jesus uh, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He was raised. You know, it's really hard for most folks to wrap their mind around it. I've been a, a believer for uh, 40 years, and sometimes I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around this whole idea of the resurrection. But the Bible says it, and I believe it. I don't just believe it because the Bible says it. I also believe it because it has changed my life, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And verses 3 and 4 uh, say together that it is all according to the Scriptures. So Paul received this truth by way of revelation, directly from God. And he's, he's writing about it for us now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, in fact, the whole, as I said a few moments ago, the whole chapter deals with the resurrection. So he, he begins by declaring the importance of the resurrection, and then he moves right on in to giving proofs that the resurrection actually occurred. And the way he does it, he just gives eyewitness accounts. I mean, that's the best kind of proof there is. We saw him with our own eyes. That's the idea here. And notice what, notice what he, he says as we uh, work through this passage. It's one thing to say that Jesus died and rose again. It's something altogether different to be able to say Jesus died and rose again and we saw him. We saw him after his resurrection from the dead. So thankfully, Paul doesn't stop with proclamation, but he provides us some proof and many convincing proofs for that matter. So post-resurrection appearances of Christ, he is saying that Jesus died and rose again and we saw him. And in the New Testament, we can isolate at least 10 distinct and separate post-resurrection appearances of Christ. And so there were a lot of people uh, who saw the risen Christ. Uh, but Paul lists five of them here. In verse 5, first part of verse 5, he says that uh, Christ, after his resurrection, appeared to Cephas, another name for Peter. Then he says he appeared to the 12. Now, you're thinking about the 12 disciples, those original disciples, of course. Uh, by this time, Judas had shown his true colors and he was out of the picture. But uh, they still refer to that group as the Twelve. And so the uh, other disciples uh, saw him. Uh, perhaps it was ten out of twelve. But they're using the term here, the Twelve, to refer uh, to that original group of disciples that Jesus called out. Then verse 6 tells us that he appeared to more than 500 people. Now, every once in a while, uh, someone who is trying to argue against the resurrection will say something like this. Well, it was... It was all a mass hallucination. Listen, 500 people, even if they've been smoking the same thing, aren't going to see the same thing, okay? So there, there's no mass hallucination going on here. These people saw him. 
They saw him. Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. They saw him with their own eyes. So there's no mass hallucination. And at this point in the early church, uh, when Paul uh, wrote this, there were, there were probably some of these 500 witnesses were still alive. This is probably 25 years after the resurrection. So some of those folks would still be alive. So there would be some folks there still living who could attest to the fact that they saw Jesus. And you could not convince them otherwise. They know that they know that they know that they saw the risen Lord. So uh, 500 witnesses. And then he says in verse 7, he appeared to James. Now, this is the half-brother of Jesus he's referring to here who uh, wrote the book of James. Uh, another appearance, he says in verse 7, was to all the apostles. And then another appearance he gives us in verse 8 was to uh, the apostle Paul himself, saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. Now, I have said this, I think, in a previous message, but... Uh, in order to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, you had to have seen the risen Lord. So there are no apostles today because nobody alive today has seen Jesus face to face. But the, the, the 11 apostles, obviously, and then uh, there was one that they uh, chose there in Acts chapter 1 to take Judah's place. And then, of course, Paul uh, was an apostle directly appointed by Jesus after his resurrection. All these apostles saw Jesus face to face after their resurrection. So they were all eyewitnesses to the resurrection. So Paul is saying, how can you say there is no resurrection? Because apparently there was a group of folks in Corinth, and if you read 1 Corinthians especially, you'll come to the quick understanding that Corinth had a lot of problems. And I guess one of the problems was that there was a group there who, who either they were struggling to believe the resurrection or they just flat out didn't believe it. They did not believe that you and I would, would one day rise from the dead. And so, so Paul moves from convincing proofs to let me give you a few problems that we have to deal with if there is no resurrection. And that's where we're going to jump forward to verse 12. Uh, he says here in these 12 through 19 that there are seven problems that arise if there is no resurrection of the dead. And the first and most important problem is if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. See how important it is? If you pull the doctrine of the resurrection out of the picture, not even Jesus has been raised. And so he just continues to list the problems. Verse 13, uh, verse uh, 13, he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. Says it again in verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. In verse 14, he says, folks like me are wasting their time if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And if the dead are not raised, the preaching of Christ is a waste of time. In fact, he says here that it, in verse uh, 14, that it's vain. That means it's futile. It's empty. There's no content to the message I'm preaching this morning if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. If there is no resurrection from the dead, really I have nothing to say whatsoever. I should just close my Bible and head on out the door this morning if Jesus has not been raised. Another problem, he says, that if there is no resurrection from the dead, Christ has not been raised. Therefore, the apostles are false witnesses of God. So they're going around saying and writing things about God and about Jesus that aren't true if there is no resurrection from the dead. You see how the problem just begins to snowball if there's no resurrection, if Christ has not been raised. Uh, a, a fourth problem, verse 17, also, uh, here says that our faith is worthless. Notice what he says. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. How many of you would like to have a worthless faith? Well, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, guess what? Your faith is worthless. It's not even worth the paper it's written on, so to speak. So, again, problems that build if we deny the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, he says also in verse 17 that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, we're still lost in our sins, so no forgiveness. So right now, you and I, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, are still lost in our sins. We are still on our way to hell and eternal separation from God and everything that is good if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. Another problem, he says uh, in verse 18, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, our dead loved ones who died believing in Christ 
are lost. In fact, he says they've perished. So, to me, that's probably one of the saddest things. If there's no resurrection of the dead, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then all of our Christian loved ones who died, they're not with Christ. They're separated from him. So see how important this doctrine, this teaching of Scripture is, and see why it is the most important doctrine in Scripture. But not only that, he says in verse 19, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, we are a miserable bunch of people, and we are to be pitied. Why? Because we have no hope. We have absolutely no hope whatsoever of any kind of future with God, with Christ, in heaven, if we reject the resurrection. If the resurre resurrection hasn't occurred, if Jesus hasn't been raised, then we're a miserable bunch of people. And so Paul says, it's of first importance, but if you don't believe it, here are the problems you have to deal with, so we work through those. But aren't you glad he didn't stop there? Notice verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So in the Greek text, this says that something happened at a point in time back yonder. Jesus rose from the dead and that he continues to live today. He's alive today. That's what Paul is saying. We call that the perfect tense, I believe, for those of you who might be English scholars and maybe even Greek scholars. I'm, I'm neither. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and he's still alive today. That's what, that's what Paul is saying here. So we have, because Christ has been raised, we have the promise of the resurrection. He, he concludes with the obvious. Jesus has been raised, therefore we too will be raised. He says that, that Jesus is the first fruits. So he's the first one who has been raised from the dead, never to die again. And one of these days... Uh, if the Lord tarries, we all know that we face death. We're all going to die. But, but the Bible says that because we die in Christ, we will one day, too, just like Jesus, be raised from the dead. So those who are asleep in Jesus, and any time the Bible in the New Testament talks about the death of a believer, it will often, most of the time, use the word sleep or sleep because he's trying to give the picture there that death is not the end for the believer, that one day the believer will be raised up from the dead. So what's the bottom line? Jesus rose from the dead. What's the most important uh, doctrine or teaching in the Christian scriptures in the Bible? Jesus rose from the dead. And to go along with that, you and I also will be raised from the dead. And as I said at the beginning of the message, we have more evidence that most people know about, more than we need to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have the scriptures, and the Bible has proven over and over and over again to be the Word of God. We have the authoritative teaching of the apostles. They laid the foundation for the church, the New Testament apostles and prophets. We have eyewitnesses who saw Jesus face to face. And as I alluded to earlier, we even have changed lives to prove that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. All throughout the history of the church, you've seen uh, person after person after person who's come to faith in Christ, many of them out of pagan backgrounds, and their lives were totally turned around for the cause of Christ. You know, people will die for a lie. We saw that on 9-11 uh, 20 years ago. But they won't knowingly die for a lie. And did you know that every time any of the apostles had a chance, and this is after the resurrection, had a chance to deny Jesus for their lives, they all chose death every single time. Not only that, this happened to at least 100 Christians in the early church. And when, when I'm referring to the early church, I'm talking about within the first century of the church. Over 100 Christians who chose death rather than to deny Christ because they had either seen him face to face or they knew someone who had seen him face to face. And because of that, they had come to faith in Christ themselves. And so they were willing to die for their faith. These people were willing to die 
because they knew the truth. Jesus is God in human flesh. He rose from the dead, never to die again. And one day, he too will rise again. I read a week or so ago that something like 60 to 93 percent of our young people who go away to secular colleges and universities walk away from the faith. So if we have 10 young people, teenagers, aspiring adults, whatever you want to call them, in this church that are getting ready to go away from college, the statistics tell us that somewhere between six and nine of them will walk away from the faith. The stuff I read went on to say that most of these who walk away will come back in their mid-30s. So by the time they're 35, they come back. The problems with this is not everyone who leaves returns. So that's a problem. And secondly, those who do return have wasted 10 to 15 years of their life that they could have invested in the kingdom of God. Why do they walk away? Peer pressure, secular professors, friends, uh, maybe one reason, sin, you know, trying to redefine God in their own image to suit and fit their own preferences. There may be some emotional reasons, you know, blaming God for various things uh, that they see in the world or that has happened in their own life. I have really thought about this in the last week or so. What if the answer to helping young people remain in the faith when they go away to secular colleges and universities is helping them to settle in their mind and their heart that Jesus died and rose again? They may not understand everything else, but if you can get them settled in their heart that Jesus died and rose again, even if they are being ridiculed for the faith, even if they can't even defend their faith in some cases, if they know that they know that they know that they know that they know in the back of their mind and in their heart that Jesus rose from the dead, and because he rose from the dead, they too one day will, be, will rise from the dead as well. I don't know, maybe a firm belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will, will help keep these young people in the faith rather than seeing them walk away. In verse 58, after Paul has gone through all of this teaching about the resurrection, listen to what he says. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is in vain in the Lord. Why fall away? Why slide into doubt when you know that Jesus died and rose again? Therefore, as Paul says, be steadfast in your faith in Jesus. He died and rose again. Be immovable about what you believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the rest of your life, no matter how young or old you are, serve the Lord. Invest your life in the kingdom of God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important teaching in the Bible. And it is that teaching that we must believe. If we want to be saved, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, my hope and my prayer this morning is that by simple childlike faith, You'll place your faith and your trust in Jesus. You'll say to, say to God, I, I may not understand it all, but I do believe that Jesus died for my sins and that he rose from the dead on the third day. And right now, the best way I know how, I'm placing my faith and my trust in Jesus. If you do that, God has not only promised he will save you, he will save you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love which you have demonstrated for each one of us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Lord, we just pray this morning that for all of us here, but especially those who may be going away to some secular college or university at some future time, Father, that you would just help them to settle in their heart right now. Jesus Christ died for my sins and he rose from the dead. And no matter what else happens, that they would be safe and secure in their faith in Jesus and that he lived, that he died, that he rose. And we pray for anyone here this morning who is not saved. We pray that right now that they would call out to you in simple faith and place their trust in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.